Thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you're first, if this is your first Sunday ever with us at Two Cities Church, I want to invite you right now before we get too much deeper into this service, would you just go ahead and go to your app store on Google Play or on the Apple App Store. Would you look for the app that says Two Cities Church? Go ahead and download that app. Click on the button that says connect and then click Sunday and today's sermon. You'll be able to follow along with everything that you hear from us today. Thanks for joining us. Why don't you go ahead and click that button that says today's sermon, and we'll dive in to Nehemiah chapter 4 together. Let's do a little bit of review. Previously in the book of Nehemiah, we're going to go back to chapter 1. Nehemiah, we learn, is this guy who is from Jerusalem. He's actually never been born there, didn't live there. But his ancestors are from Jerusalem, but he's got a cush job right now. He's serving wine in the palace to the king that is the most powerful man on earth. And amazingly, Nehemiah learns that the walls in Jerusalem are torn down, that the people are having a really tough time. And instead of just simply blowing it off, God puts on Nehemiah's heart a desire to do something about it. So he does something bold. He goes to his boss and he says, hey, can I have a leave of absence to go do some work in my ancient family homeland? And his boss says, yeah, go ahead, Nehemiah. Nehemiah does more than that. He says, well, can I have letters of safe passage traveling from the capital of Persia all the way back to Jerusalem, about 700 miles of journey back to Jerusalem, and the boss gives him a letter, and then he takes it a step further and says, hey, king, would you be willing to give me some cash to go rebuild the city? And incredibly, because the heart of the king is in God's hands, the king writes him a check, and Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. In chapter 2, Nehemiah goes around the city, and it's worse than the stories and the reports that he's heard. The walls are in ruin, the, the, the uh, symbols of the wall, the gates, the, the, the stones themselves have been absolutely torn down. This city is a disaster. So chapter 3, Nehemiah rolls up his sleeves, and instead of complaining, instead of real, uh, thinking it's way too much work, Nehemiah gets busy. And he assembles this unusual team of almost everybody in the city who is willing to roll up their sleeves and to get busy going to work on a wall that has been in rubble for more than a hundred years. Nehemiah is getting stuff done. And anytime somebody starts to get stuff done, they're going to face opposition. I'm telling you this. Because anytime you start to get stuff done, anytime you start to make an impact, even if your motives are right, like Nehemiah, even if you're trying to do a good work, like Nehemiah, anytime that you try to get something done, there are going to be haters who are going to criticize and complain. There are going to be some bullies out there that will do whatever they can to stop you from succeeding. It really feels today like two of the big bullies that we're going to read about in Nehemiah chapter 4. These two feel to me like two elementary school boys in the backseat of a minivan, minivan complaining about their homework. And you probably have felt like this as a parent. You're probably thinking to yourself, oh, your homework is simple math and coloring pages. What could you possibly have to complain about? Well, there are two guys in Nehemiah chapter 4 that are going to complain. They're going to criticize. Eventually, they will do whatever they can to stop Nehemiah from rebuilding this city. They're acting like a bunch of spoiled babies sitting around in poopy pants complaining about what Nehemiah is accomplishing. And so if they're going to act like big babies, we're going to treat them like big babies today. See, here's what I want you to see from this sermon today. Jesus asks his people to have a simple faith, a childlike faith. And a childlike faith, even the most simple faith, is always bigger than your grown-up problems. 
Nehemiah faces some real threats, some real danger today, and he does it with simple faith. And it is amazing what happens through Nehemiah's simple faith. What we're going to do is we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 4, and we're going to use three common phrases that you heard on the playground when you were a little kid. You probably heard these while you were growing up. My guess is you said these phrases yourself while you were growing up. And we're going to look at these little, these big grown-up problems through a childlike faith. And when you start to face critics, when you start to deal with problems, I hope that these three childlike phrases will stick in your mind as a way to have a childlike faith in the midst of some big grown-up problems. Here's the first statement you've said when you were on the playground as a little girl or a little boy. You know how this statement goes. Sticks and stones may say the rest of it. Oh, I can't hear what you're saying because I'm not right there with you anyway. But my guess is you know how this statement goes. Well, Nehemiah has got some haters that are going to criticize him, going to stop at nothing to prevent him from rebuilding Jerusalem. And the city walls are nothing but broken sticks and burnt stones is what we read today. And Nehemiah, amidst this rubble of the city, rolls up his sleeves and he gets to work and he gets busy amidst great criticism and severe persecution. Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says it this way. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and he mocked the Jews before his colleagues and powerful men of Samaria. Now let me just put it to you this way. A guy who is trying to criticize, who wants to make himself feel big, by making you look small, they always get emboldened when they get around their friends and their, their colleagues. Because they're strength in numbers, they decide, you know what, now I'm going to talk bad about him to his face. I would never do it by myself, but because I got my posse with me, now I can go ahead and talk bad about him. And Sanballat is going to criticize and hate on Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is doing nothing wrong here. Here's how he criticizes Nehemiah. Here's what he says. He gets around these powerful men of Samaria, and he says, what are these pathetic Jews doing? These weak, these feeble, frail Jews, what are they doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life? from the mounds of rubble. And now, of course, Sanballat's buddy chimes in, a guy by the name of Tobiah. Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up on what they were building, he would break down their stone wall. Now, Sanballat and Tobiah have shown up before in the book of Nehemiah, but we've just kind of blown over these two. Now it's time to figure out who these two guys really are. Sanballat is a political opponent to Nehemiah. His, he's actually a foreigner. His name literally means sin has given life. He is the opposite spiritually of a guy like Nehemiah. And it doesn't matter where you're at on this Republican-Democratic debate. You can consider Sam Ballot to be Nancy Pelosi. Maybe you feel like Sam Ballot is Donald Trump, and, no, and Nehemiah is the opposite political party. You and I should probably expect, it would be wrong for us not to expect some political opposition anytime you start to do stuff. Because when you start to make a splash, People are going to stand up and take notice, and there are some people that just don't share your views. They don't hold to your faith, and they're going to do what they can to criticize you because they don't uh, believe what you believe. That's the kind of guy that Sam Ballot is. That kind of criticism makes sense. It hurts, but it makes sense. Tobiah, on the other hand, this cuts deep. These were words do break bones, 
and leave bruises. Because Tobiah, though he's an Ammonite, he's from a neighboring country. Tobiah, we realize, has married into the families in Jerusalem, married into some very powerful families. He is, by marriage, related to Eliashib, the high priest of Israel, which means the very moment that Tobiah is criticizing Nehemiah, his wife's family is working on this wall. And Tobiah is the friend that stabs you in the back and then turns the knife a little bit. It hurts when Sam Ballot criticizes you, when your political enemies hate on you. But it hurts really bad when your friends turn on you. And that's what you have here in Nehemiah chapter 4. They mock him. They are furious. The Old Testament language here is they are burning with anger because of the good work that Nehemiah is trying to do. And of course, their strength in numbers, so they get all of their buddies, their whole uh, crew around them, and they all start to criticize Nehemiah for the work that he's doing. People will mock you. People will hate you. People will run you down. And like Nehemiah, you don't even have to do anything wrong. Just accomplish something. And they're going to criticize you. In fact... Let me put it to you this way. The only guy or the only gal that doesn't have to worry about criticism is the guy or the gal that's doing nothing. Because if you do anything in this highly politicized, very critical culture that we live in, somebody's going to talk bad about you. In this 24-hour news channel world that we live in, some reporter is going to rush to a story and they're going to report facts without ever trying to figure out what the context was. And they're going to attack you for something that you said by taking it completely out of context. There's some blogger who's going to try to make himself look good and get more social media followers by making you look bad. This happened in Nehemiah's day. It continues to our day. And Nehemiah doesn't hate on these guys. He doesn't return evil for evil. Nehemiah is an Old Testament example of what Romans chapter 12, verse 17 says. Go back after this message and go read Romans 12, 17. Because as Christians... We don't return criticism for criticism. We don't return slander for slander. We don't return evil for evil. Nehemiah could easily stand up and say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words hurt really, really bad. Nehemiah has to deal with verbal criticism, but the work that he's doing is fragile. It feels right now like if the big bad wolf shows up and puffs and puffs, this whole wall can come tumbling down around them. So when you start to deal with your critics, I want you to think about this phrase that you heard from the, the nursery rhymes when you were a little child. When the big bad wolf shows up and threatens to huff and puff and blow your wall down. Because that's where Nehemiah is. This is a delicate fragile moment in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And this is a moment where if the work stops, all of the backbreaking, gut-wrenching work that's happened up to this point, it can all be undone in a second. Nehemiah recognizes this. In fact, that's what he says when he goes to God and prays about this situation. Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Listen, our God. We're basically reading from Nehemiah's prayer journal right now. Listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their own heads and let them be taken as plunder to a, to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have provoked the builders. Nehemiah tells us just how fragile this moment is in rebuilding Jerusalem. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had the will to keep working. Listen for just a second. 
Nehemiah realizes this criticism could easily take away their heart to keep working. I got to do something about this criticism. And by the way, the wall is starting to come together. It's starting to be rebuilt, but it's not nearly big enough to defend us yet. This is a really fragile moment. So here's what Nehemiah says next. When Sobat sent Balak and Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard that the repairs to the wall of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. And then they all, these are political enemies, people that have nothing to do with one another, but now they've got a common objective to stop Israel and Jerusalem from being rebuilt. So they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw it into confusion. So here's how Nehemiah responds. So we prayed to our God. We didn't just bow our heads and close our eyes and fold our hands and pray and then bite our fingernails after we say amen. No, we prayed to our God and we stationed guards because of them day and night. Nehemiah knows this is a really delicate moment in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah wants to keep working. He wants the people to keep working. But these haters, these critics are becoming very vocal, trying to make themselves look big by making Nehemiah and the people working on the walls look small. So Nehemiah does something that I think is amazing. Instead of getting into an argument with them, which is how I would probably respond. You know how it goes. When you get into an argument with your spouse, our first reaction, instead of listening, instead of taking it to the Lord, our first reaction is usually to sit there and to argue right back why we're right and they're wrong. Nehemiah doesn't do that. Nehemiah probably realizes, you look like an idiot when you argue with idiots, and these guys are idiots, so I'm just not going to argue with them. Nehemiah also doesn't take a punch when this goes on. He goes to God first, and he goes to God last. And let me tell you what I mean by this. Nehemiah's first response when people hate on him, when they criticize him, when they run you down, Nehemiah's first response is to go to God and to say, God, you heard what they have to say. God, you know my heart. God, I need you to vindicate me. He goes to God first, but Nehemiah also goes to God last. Nehemiah basically realizes this. God, we're in your hands, and we're desperately in need of your power right now. God, if you can't help us, lastly, ultimately, if you can't help us, then nobody can help us. God, we're in trouble. And here's what Nehemiah really does for us today. He turns to the other chief. And y'all, I can't tell you how much courage, how hard it is to do what Nehemiah is doing here. You see, when we start to face our critics, when they start to criticize us, our natural reaction is to sit there and to give them what for. Our natural reaction is to face them and to, re, uh, to respond to their criticism. But instead of doing that, Nehemiah turns from them and he turns to someone else. He turns his back to his critics, and he turns to his God, and he says, God, you heard what they have to say. God, you are my vindication. God, I need you to step in, and I need you to give me strength in the midst of this. You see, what is it that's made all of these foreigners from around the city of Jerusalem come together and stop this work? Well, it's nothing short of religious persecution, and it's nothing short of racism. You see, they don't want the walls to be rebuilt because they don't want the city to be re-inhabited by the Jews. They don't want the city to be rebuilt because they don't want the temple to be restored, and they don't want the temple to re be restored because they don't want to see sacrifices in that temple again. So these Foreigners living in the land of Judah will stop at nothing to prevent this wall from being rebuilt. 
Y'all, unfortunately, the racism that Nehemiah is experiencing in chapter 4 back in Bible times, it's still around today. Unfortunately, it's still around us in the Chattahoochee Valley, and Nehemiah calls it what it is. Racism is not a skin color. It's not a type of religion um, issue. It is ultimately a sin issue. And I'm going to tell you honestly, over the last couple of years, I have sat in the offices of some of the powerful business and political leaders in this community. And I've had them criticize and threaten me because of my very open stance about the racial injustice that I see in the Chattahoochee Valley. I mean, I've heard these words coming out of people who claim to be Christians' mouths, who said, Jeff, our churches are all white churches or all black churches. That's the way it's been down here. That's the way it's always going to be down here. Why are you trying to stop that? Why are you trying to address this? And although I try not to get into an argument on this issue, I just let them know this is not a color of skin problem. This is a sin problem. Because what you're talking about right now is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who did Christ come for? Who did he die for? Who can be made sons and daughters of God? You see, anytime I see a church with all one color of skin in a community that has very different ethnicities, very different cultures, something is wrong with that church. And I'm telling you this, because maybe you don't live in our community, Two Cities Church was started as a church that will really represent the gospel of Jesus Christ in all of its cultural uh, um, beauty in our community. We want to be a church that looks like our community. And for us, this isn't just something that we're trying to do. No, this is who we are. Because we believe this is what the family of God looks like. And when a church is in a multicultural neighborhood, but it looks like all one color of skin, I would tell any man to his face as the pastor of that church, there's something wrong here. And it is a sin issue, not a skin color issue. Nehemiah is around some big bad wolves that are now starting to huff and puff and do anything they can to stop this wall from being rebuilt. So here's the third and the final phrase. And chances are you learned this when you were a little child getting ready to go to sleep at night. But the threats against Nehemiah are very real now. His life is in danger. Not just him, but the lives of the men and women that are working on the wall. So when it gets that bad, I want you to keep these words in the back of your mind. If I should die before I wake. Nehemiah knows to trust what happens next in the hands of God. Nehemiah, his, he is in danger here. In fact, he tells us just how dangerous this is, starting in verse 10. In Judah, the men of Judah, when they came and saw that Jerusalem was rebuilding the walls, here's what they used to say about rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. In Judah, it was said, the strength of the laborer fails since there is so much rubble. We will never be able to rebuild the walls. And our enemies said, they won't know or see anything until we're among them. This is ambush language. Until we're among them and can kill them to stop the work. The people that were living in the land for a hundred years saw the broken sticks and the burnt stones and said, it's too much work. There's no way we can restore it. And every time we try, they attack us and fight against us and try to kill us for restoring the wall. Here's what Nehemiah chapter 4 says next. Then the Jews who lived nearby arrived. And they said to us time and again, everywhere you turn, they attack us. So I stationed people behind the lowest sections of the wall at vulnerable areas. I stationed them by families with swords and spears 
and bows. This is a brilliant move by a leader. Because here's what Nehemiah realizes. Our wall is not tall enough to protect us right now. We're starting to put the pieces together. Bricks are starting to lock in with one another. But our wall is not nearly big enough to protect us. And the people, if they lose heart, will stop working. So Nehemiah strategically positions people by families at very vulnerable points in the wall. You know why this is so brilliant? Because if you want to see a man fight to the death, you put him right next to his daughter, right next to his wife, right next to his mother when they're attacked, and you will see a man who will turn into a lion. So Nehemiah stations families around the wall. And he tells them, don't just grab your trowel and your hammer and start working on the wall. You better pick up your sword, go get your hunting rifle, go get your bow and arrow, and take them with you because you very well may be attacked tonight. And here's what he says next. After I made an inspection, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Picture what you're hearing in the Bible in your mind for just a second. We're at the wall, and the wall is low, and it's not nearly tall enough to protect us. And there's a bunch of bad guys out there that will do anything to include kill us to stop the work. So Nehemiah basically stands up, puts his hands on his hips. He looks at the people that are working on the wall, and he says to them, you don't have to be afraid. Now, all of them, realize that this is life or death, what they're doing right now. But Nehemiah boldly, courageously stands before them, and he tells them, don't worry about it. If you want to know where that kind of courage comes from, Nehemiah tells you where it comes from. He says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord, and fight for your countrymen. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your homes. Nehemiah understands this is a precarious moment, and we have a lot to lose. He doesn't just pray, but he also posts guards. He gets busy, and he realizes we may have to fight to the death to get this city rebuilt. Maybe you've never really paid attention to it, but you know that title slide to this whole sermon series? Did you ever notice that in the bottom corner of that slide, there are two symbols? These two symbols represent what we're trying to do as a church, Two Cities Church, restoring and rebuilding the Chattahoochee Valley. There are two symbols that recognize what Nehemiah is trying to do in the entire book, especially in chapter 4. It's the sword and it's the shovel. And Nehemiah realizes we got a lot of hard, back-breaking work in front of us. That's the shovel. But there's a lot of people out there that will do whatever they can to stop this work from being done. So get the sword with one hand and the shovel with the other hand and get busy. Nehemiah also realizes, look at the name. We can't do this on our own. He, God, is going to have to be at work through me, Nehemiah in order for this wall to be restored. That's why the title slide to this, show, this sermon series shows the word he and the word I, God working through us. But it also shows a sword and a shovel, God showing us we've got some hard work to do, but he's going to be our shield. He's going to be our protection. If you want to know what Nehemiah is telling people today, he's telling them, you don't have to be afraid. Because our God is greater than your problems. Would you listen to me for just a second? You don't have to worry about the haters that are criticizing you on social media, about those that are complaining against you. Your God is greater than the folks that are criticizing, than the bullies that are throwing their weight around. Listen to me. Our God is greater than this global problem that we're dealing with. He's big enough to handle it. 
Our God is greater than the economic uncertainty that we're struggling with right now. He is greater than the plunging oil prices and then the stock market that's up one day and down the next. He's greater than the political division, than the persecution that you may be suffering. Our God is great enough that he can handle all your fears. If you will turn to him and trust in him and turn away from those fears, that are right in front of your face and are screaming for your attention. See, I'm going to challenge you. Take a couple of action steps today. Maybe today what you need to do is turn from your fears, number two on this list, and you need to turn to the Holy Spirit and say, I believe that you're my sword. I believe that you're my shield. I believe that you will protect me. I will not fear Maybe you need to do number three on that list. Maybe instead of trying to defend yourself, trying to argue and trying to take a punch or to win an argument, you need to turn the other cheek. It is hard to do, and it takes God's help sometimes to be able to turn the other cheek and to just simply let it go. But maybe you tuned into this broadcast. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe right now the Holy Spirit is showing you if today was the day that you stood before God, if today was the last day of your life, you're not going to spend eternity with him in heaven. Maybe what you need is to turn your soul over to King Jesus for the first time. I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to challenge you to respond to what you're hearing today. If you're able to do this right there in your living room or maybe in your kitchen, would you just stop what you're doing? Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me as I pray for you? Father, I pray for people that are watching this who may not know you as Savior. Maybe today is the day that you help them realize, I, I can't be good enough. I can't work hard enough. I can't do enough religious things to clean myself up, to make me pure. I, I realize today that I am dead in my sin and completely incapable of making myself alive again. Dead is dead and alive is alive. And God, I need you to do a miracle. I need you to uh, make what is dead alive. I need you to come in and to clean me up and to change me and to turn me into a new man or a new woman. God, would you hear this prayer? Holy Spirit, would you honor this prayer? Would you cause somebody right where they're sitting to say, I'm turning from my sin, I'm turning to you, I am trusting you for the first time in my life. And then God, would you do a miracle in their heart and would you give us the privilege of finding out about it and following up with them about it? God, maybe your people are struggling right now with real fears about the future and they need your Holy Spirit to help them have peace in the midst of the storm, to trust you in spite of the persecution or the criticism or the threats or just the unknown. God, when the threats get real, when the fear is severe, would you help us to have the kind of strength that Nehemiah had to turn the other cheek, to turn from our problems and to turn you and to trust you. Nehemiah didn't just pray, but he also posted guards. And so God, I, I know that you expect us to to not just trust you with it, but, to, but also to get to work and to do our part. But God, would you help us to turn to you first and to turn to you foremost before we do anything else? I, I pray for your people that are hearing this today. I pray that you will hear their prayer, that you will move in their midst, and that you will do a great work in their life right now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're taking some kind of action step, we would love to know what that is. You can let us know in that mobile app. You can let us know by sending us an email. You can send an email to info at twocitieschurch.com, the number two cityschurch.com. Hey, if you have uh, not connected with us before, maybe you just found us on the internet this week. Would you, we'd like to know who you are. Would you sign up for one of our social media channels? Would you subscribe to our YouTube channel? Would you, better yet, would you sign up for our newsletter? You can do this on our homepage, twocitieschurch.com. 
you can do it right there in our mobile app. That mobile app you can find in both Google Play and the Apple App Store just by typing in the number two and the word cities and looking for our app there. It looks like this. If you're not connected with other believers, we really want to help you get connected. We call this doing life together. And so we would love to be able to get you connected. In that mobile app, there's a tab that says life groups. Let us know who you are. We'll try to custom fit you to a life group. Or you can just jump into one that meets this Wednesday night um, by the tab that's right there in that mobile app. We're giving away 100% of what comes in this month. So if you want to give, there are ways that you can give either by sending us a check or through our mobile app or on our website. But I just need you to know we're not keeping one penny of what comes in this month. 100% of it is going to help people in our church and in our community that are in need. And whatever you give this month will go to people that are in need. Maybe you need prayer. If that's you, we would be honored to pray for you. You can let us know that by just sending us an email, info at Two City Church, put prayer in the subject line, or there's a tab in that mobile app that says prayer. We want to pray for you. We want to come alongside you as you struggle with whatever it is that you're going through right now. The last announcement that I want to make to you is about next week. If you're like me, you're trying to figure out, are we going to be able to meet in person next week? And the answer to that question is, I don't know. You are probably aware that the governor of Georgia, Governor Kemp, has started to slowly, systematically loosen some of the shelter-in-place restrictions in the state of Georgia. But I just need you to understand, for Two Cities Church, because we meet at the Cunningham Center on the campus of Columbus State University, it really doesn't matter what the governor of Georgia decides. What matters for us is what the president of Columbus State University, or more importantly, what the um, board of regents for the University of Georgia system in the state decide. So as soon as we know some information, we'll let you know. The best way to find out when we'll be able to start meeting together in person again is to stay connected to our, our social media channels, or even better, to keep a lookout for our newsletters, because that's exactly how we're going to let you know when we'll be able to meet together again. If we are not able to meet together in person next week, then I hope to see you online back here again. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a great week. God bless you.